Good morning, fellow explorers. Today I'll be interviewing an extraordinary man. His name is Dennis DeYoung, most known for his research into the Urantia book. Um, the Urantia book is one that aims to combine religion, science and spirituality. Um, so Dennis participated in some expeditions on the Cyprus coast to try and bring to surface evidence for what was written in this book. But he'll tell us more about that when we have a chat to him. So let's go explore, express and exchange. Welcome Dennis, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. For those not yet familiar with the Urantia book, and I myself am interested to find out more, I guess could you start with um, what it is and how you discovered it? Sure, well, um, um, when I found the Urantia book, it's really part of a, a journey that started from my childhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, to go right back to the beginning briefly, it started at Sunday school, for example, in church, where I just wanted to, you know, I remember the teacher um, teaching us how to pray, right, and we'd go through a prayer. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I felt a, a sincerity to know God and to find out who God is mm -hmm. and that type of thing. And yeah. I never really let go of that from those um, early beginnings. And so throughout my kind of life, um, venturing through uh, childhood and adolescence, I always kept this little thread of God alive. And um, throughout um, the latter part of my teenage years, I went to a couple of Bible colleges because mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what I wanted to get to know God a little mm -hmm. bit more. So I thought I'd go to a Bible college as a part of a, a vast experience of churches, different types of churches, to find out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I went to this uh, Bible college or a couple of them. I only lasted six months because I felt in my spirit I wanted to move on. Yeah. But uh, I met a lot of really nice people who were sincere and um, uh, and that journey led me, uh, after the Bible college experiences, I went overseas where I, I studied and learned how to fly helicopters and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, prior, before I went overseas, I found the, uh, a friend of mine um, gave me the Arandi book to borrow and of course I was interested in God, so I thought, oh, you know, this is, is the Arandi book. Yeah, this wow. is the book. It's very loved, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a f fantastic book. But at that time when I read it, um, because I was fairly busy, um, I read like a few papers and it, it impressed me and yet it was quite in depth. And then I thought, oh, you know, that's a really good book, but, you know, I'm a little bit too busy to read it. So, um, so I went on in life and it ended up in my father's library just sitting there collecting dust. So um, anyway, I was living in the United States for a while and I learned how to fly helicopters where eventually that path led me on to flying choppers on tuna boats. So I did that off and on for quite some time. And uh, there was this one trip where I needed some reading material, something I could be interested in. And uh, before going out on a boat trip, uh, um, I, I looked in my father's library and I found the Arantia book and I thought, oh yeah, I remember that book, I've got to read that book. So it took me about six weeks to read it from cover to cover mm -hmm. whilst out in the ocean. Gee. And it really changed my... it confirmed everything that I kind of knew mm -hmm. and it confirmed um, a lot of the teachings in um, like the Bible colleges and all the various churches I went to. Because it was like a quest of searching for God, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Even though he's within you, but, um, you know, I think meeting people and um, experiencing life with people, you get a broader perspective, you know, from their uh, yeah. experience. So, anyway, I read this book on the boat. Going back to the boat, I read this book. And I read about the first Garden of Eden. And I was just so impressed by it. And I remember walking up to the flight deck on a full moon, and it was a still night somewhere in the Western Pacific. And I, you know, I sort of remembered you're saying to God, God, you know, I really wanted to discover this place, you know, that'd be a fantastic experience to read about it, all in this book, yeah, and to find the actual evidence, yeah. so we're talking about hard evidence, and also talking about a journey of faith, so after that boat trip finished, I went back home, and I bought all these maps, bathymetric maps, and so forth, and I bought the, um, uh, the geographic type maps, mm -hmm. and I could see this little kind of uh, peninsula, submerged submerged peninsula, peninsula off the coast of Cyprus connecting onto Syria and I, I, I you know, correlated that with the book 
And I thought, that's the place, that's the place. So I brought the National Geographic map and I put it on my lounge room and from time to time I would gaze upon it. And, and, uh, and then life took its course and it took me on different paths mm -hmm. and so forth. And then uh, about a few years later, up around 96, 97, I met a guy called uh, Robert uh, BZ Samars who also had a mutual interest in discovering Eden. Mm -hmm. But he was a bit more advanced than what I was at that time. And he had a video out called Divine Legacy, trying to connect all these various um, parallels in um, ancient Sumerian texts with what the Urandi book says. And so I was pretty engrossed by that. And eventually I wrote to him and we got to know mm -hmm. each other and we became good friends for, for many years and still are good friends. And uh, it was about... Uh, about 2001, he sent me a couple of um, 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 couple of books that he proposed to write. But the Garden of the Gods was one. Oh, so that was one that. manuscript he sent me, which is quite impressive. Mm -hmm. And then the other manuscript he he sent me evolved into a book called Discovery of Atlantis. Wow. And um, so he believed he could match up about 90 various points yeah. of the Atlantis story which cooperates with the Submerged Garden of Eden, which mm -hmm. I agree with, because I also did a similar study on that, and I found a lot of parallels of the Atlantis, Plato's Atlantis story, that um, cooperates with uh, that submerged landmass mm -hmm. and the location of Eden proper. So I was quite... Um, so in 2003, it was a, a work that... Um, yeah, before the book was released, it took about a year to write, and the book was released in 2003. And the whole idea was to uh, uh, create awareness as well as to create finance or find finance to perform mm -hmm. the first expedition. So uh, after about oh, about eight months of the release of the book, uh, uh, BZ Samas went to um, Cyprus and worked there for a while and did some presentation and uh, uh, raised some money to perform the first expedition. So that's what kind of happened. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book, it tells us that um, Eden proper, the only thing left standing in Eden proper was the Acropolis Hill and the wall. Mm -hmm. and the, the Acropolis Hill um, in the Urandi book is described as the shrine of the father, mm -hmm. and the wall, a natural wall, went around it. And they were the only thing surviving. And after this exp expedition, before, it, well, whilst he was on the ocean, um, I, from a, a, a French um, um, company, did some bathymetric scans of the um, Mediterranean and found um, and came out with these type of results Gee, as well. So you found the location? Yeah, yeah the location yeah. of the submerged um, Edenix Peninsula, which um, connects Cyprus to um, Syria here, oh, wow. and Eden is in that position there. And as he looked a bit further, we could find the Acropolis Hill and the wall that surrounded the Acropolis Hill. And around that area is the Garden of Eden or the city of the Garden of Eden. Yeah. So that was basically the objective to find this kind of evidence. Mm -hmm. So he performed this, um, this exploration, um, he performed the first expedition and in 2007 he um, performed another expedition to um, verify uh, the wall mm -hmm. to make sure that it was natural. As from my um, uh, input into the expedition, what I did was the website and everything that he'd sent through I posted up on the website mm -hmm. and all that type of thing. But as I started to look into the books, I started to find all these fragments knowing that this location was really the Garden of Eden, which um, have a lot of cooperations with the Atlantis story. So I did my own investigation into various books of religion and so forth, and I could see all these match-ups, all these connections. And, um, you know, like in the Bible, it talks about the end comes from the beginning mm -hmm. in Isaiah. Not necessarily the end of the world or anything, but um, it's, like, it's like the world being born anew mm -hmm. with a new knowledge and new understanding which upgrades a lot of the information that we already have, whether it's spiritual or religious and mm -hmm. so forth. And so I believe that that beginning, in Matthew 19, Jesus talks about the beginning, making reference to Adam and Eve. So we've got this focus on the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so many, much of the information, like in the Bible, we've, when you've got the right focus on the tree of life, all these little fragments throughout all the books of religion that are pertinent to the Garden of Eden start to create, put together, starts to create this reality image of reality that we're currently walking in at the moment. Can you see, like yeah. a walking picture, like yeah. a living picture, mm -hmm. a living image. And that's what I feel is going on at the moment. And, and what is the message that this book is teaching people exactly? Oh, well, it's, it kind of exposes a whole history mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning. Um, so does it point. relate to the Bible and, and other Yeah, it quotes a lot, more from the Bible mm -hmm. than any other book mm -hmm. that we have. Uh, it talks about um, uh, this book is broken up into four parts. The central super universe, mm -hmm. the local universe, the history of Urantia of our Earth, yeah. And the uh, the life and teachings of J Jesus, because uh -huh. he was very significant, yeah. and is still quite significant mm -hmm. for now and in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole reiteration. It's a revealing of the hidden, unveiled, yeah. the great book unveiled at this time, and it creates a roadmap for humanity on a spiritual religious basis. It also upgrades all the religions and philosophies that we have. And um, it's about God and the personal relationship between mankind and with God in a personal way, as a friend. It's not to do with ceremonies and mm -hmm. forms and rituals or being there at this day and all that type of thing. Yeah. Or it's nothing to do with buildings and material or anything. Yeah. It's just about the individual and God and working together as a team and getting to know each other. Yeah. So that's what I found. Um, and uh, yeah, and its purpose is to really upgrade what we have. Yeah. And I did notice also that it says that it's, um, it comes from celestial beings or that it was channeled by, this information was channeled. Uh, well, yeah, it's not channeled in terms of um, a person goes into a trance and something else, uh, you know, yeah. invades, the, infests the body with their own. It's got nothing to do with channeling as you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. with other books and so forth. Uh, it's all to do with the fragment of God mm -hmm. within you. And um, this was a self-acting thought adjuster. I mean, you'd have to research that for yourself. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, this thought adjuster would um, oper be a liaison um, between um, you know, the, the certain personalities of the universe um, concerning seraphims or Melchizedeks and so forth. And this person, um, the subject, was asleep. You know, totally unconscious, not like Edgar Case or anything. Okay, yep. It was just asleep and would just simply talk in his sleep and would study for about 20 years until they decided, the, uh, Dr. Sadler uh, decided to put a forum of pe uh, people together to write questions. So mm -hmm. uh, one day this, this subject would answer these questions and that's how the Iran people come to pass, which yeah. was in 1934 and um, it was published, the book was published in 1955. So, the, uh, now some people may say channeling and so forth, but this book um, doesn't subscribe to channeling mm -hmm. as we understand it. Okay. Um, actually, find it quite sordid, to tell you the truth, because it can be very misleading. So what this book does is take us on a journey, this is what we say, so, you know, go on the journey, and find the evidence. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about words, we're talking about evidence being led by a book on a journey of faith. And that's what life is all about. The best way that we learn is through journeying, following our, our heart or our idea, and finding the evidence that connect all these thoughts together. And also in your experience, and maybe from the point of view of the Urantia book as well, what is your opinion um, about the world that we're living in? Uh, why it is the way it is and maybe where we're headed? Oh, well, you know, I, I, believe, um, yeah, I, th I believe there's a big future on this planet. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth has to be re-established or established and re-established again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what is that truth? Oh, well, you know, the truth of our origins. Yeah. That we can prove where we come from. Yeah. Um, you know, I, of course, we've discovered the sunken um, Edenic Peninsula regarding to First Eden. Yeah. But the, the real test is another city which lay submerged in the Persian Gulf 
which is a triangular city with a circular um, formation which helped be held the tree of life. And I think I know where that is in the Persian Gulf through the benefit of um, uh, bathymetric mapping done by NASA Worldwind Software before they devalued the, uh, their software. But I've still got images of that. And that's, um, you know, near the coast of Iran, you know, right in the middle of the Persian Gulf, close to a gas field. So, um, you know, the, that has certain characteristics, which has the formation of a triangular city, split up into ten divisions, and it has a, a, a circular um, characteristic in the middle of this triangle. So that's where the triangle circle comes from, that whole idea from the beginning. And this is where the sons of God, prior to the Illuminati, came down from heaven to earth to teach mankind civilised life, mm -hmm. which we have today, you know. Yeah. And, um, and that city beheld the tree of life, which is a shrub that comes from the garden, and um, it was these sons of God that came down from heaven to earth that needed this, uh, the fruit of the tree of life to give them immortality. And that's how, why this city existed for 300,000 years before it fell into rebellion. And of course, after that, 50,000 years after that, they built the city of Dilmun, which is in Mes Lower Mesopotamia. And that's where a lot of the Sumerian uh, ideas come out of this Dilma, Dilmun and the Illuminati kind of um, origins as well, too. But that's, a for, um, you know, that's... Um, you know, that was part of the fallen race that the Bible, the Nephilim, the yeah. uh, Bible talks about, but the progen uh, but the forerunners of the uh, um, Nodites, mm -hmm. or you know. So does it does it um, clarify where our origins are, the origins of human beings? Um... Yeah, well, we're evolutionary, and um, but uh, we're, it's it's a combination of evolutionary and creational, okay. like. Evolution is the process, yeah. and there's various mutations, but the spark of life has to occur at one point, right? Yeah. And uh, so it's a combination. There's will behind this whole thing that we live in, mm -hmm. and uh, and that will is given life through that one spark of life, but follows an evolutionary process. Okay. Like we weren't like zapped into um, existence six thousand years ago. Yeah. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like that. I mean, that's one way of reading them. But if you look at the first of the seventh day, we're looking at a whole progression of evolution and time. That's another way of looking at mm -hmm. it. So, you know, I disagree with the, um, the people who believe that, you know, we're here six, for 6,000 years. I disagree with that completely. Our origins of man, sentient man, of self-reflectivity, go back a million years. Mm -hmm. And then we are mutated in one family 500,000 years um, where one family had 18 kids and each pair would, had a different characteristic, a colour of skin and that type of thing. And that's how the races bore out. Mm. Then eventually they got bigger, transmigrated, wiped each other out and all that type of thing. But at the same time, 500,000 years, the sons of God came down and had part human, part, you know, heavenly kind of um, genes that could um, have benefit of the tree of life and gave them immortality. And it was then that taught us about civilization today. But they were very primitive in those days, you know. And man's. the sons of God that you speak of, mm. is this, um, I want to just clarify, are you talking about like extraterrestrial beings? No, or? no, this is eternal realm beings, okay. their personality. This is not like aliens from uh, yeah, Andromeda or anything like that. It's nothing to do with that. There is a sphere close by to us that evolved a, uh, a race of non-breathers. That might explain some of the uh, pictures that you see of greys and so forth. Mm -hmm. They can exist in an environment where there is no air and they're called non-breathers, right? The whole universe is full of life and I believe th it's, these non-breathers very, live very close by to us or next to us and they could be related to Mars or the moon or something, but they evolved like we evolved yeah. and mutated over time and eventually they come to a point where they mutate in such a way that their brains were a lot larger and they could comprehend them all yeah. and they had the um, ability of self-reflectivity mm -hmm. and, um, and which, uh, which transpires in worship and wisdom.
you know, yeah. worshipping something greater than yourself. And it doesn't mean to say worship in the sense that we know it, but it could be an appreciation. Mm. It's very interesting. I just wanted to touch briefly on what your opinion is on death and the afterlife. Um, the only thing, our whole idea of being here is soul building and gaining experience because okay. our destiny, we're only here for a short period of time, yeah. but our destiny, real destiny, lies in the eternal realm, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with extraterrestrials or space time beings or anything. It, we, we will enter a whole different world beyond this where there's a lot, a, great, a, a greater amount of elements and you know, there's all kinds of personalities from different parts of the universe that you'll meet. It's like a big, giant, universal family, mm -hmm. but we can't see it. We haven't got the eyesight to see these mm -hmm. these beings, who are here as well too, called angels and, yeah, and yeah. other type of personalities. But, um, yeah, that is our destiny. And our, our journey is through this whole universe to the central universe which is paradise that a lot of people talk oh, about yeah. you know. but we in all that we're soul building and mm -hmm. gaining experience and with the learning. soul building does that incorporate Life incarnation uh, and you know oh well in, in, uh, i'm not really into reincarnation i don't believe we come back here our future is is forward and our, our souls will be repersonalized in a new body made of energy, not of flesh and blood oh, anymore. And yes. that will have immortality. We'll have the bodies of like angels, but you will know yourself as you know yourself now, and you will recognize your past experiences as you experience here. Um, so there's still that, there, you still have an identity, you say? Yeah, okay. you will know, as you know yourself now, you will continue to know yourself and you will grow mm -hmm. um, beyond time space. Everything is reflected. On in heaven as on earth, every we we have there's reflectivity going on all the time. So, you know, when uh, people talk about the city of God in the Bible and the design of it, well, maybe that's the design of the Garden of Eden, of the city of the Garden of Eden, and that's what we have to find out, find the city and its design, and uncover it, and that'll make I'm quite sure that'll make a, a connection with the Bible. So you can start to put all these things together. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a revelation through a physical discovery, which brings upon a, a realization mm -hmm. and creates a path, and and where it does prove that God is personal and He exists, and our personality personifies Him. And we're all various personalities, and um, and love is the whole idea, truth, understanding, all mm -hmm. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what my aim to do is. Yeah. What happens. <laughs> You're <laughs> you know? on your way already, you though. Really, you might go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's what I suggest. Why don't we all go in a big boat together <laughs> and have a look in the I see and read? You know, I I, I read it and I see it, and there's the evidence, and we can have a great time. You know, and have debates and, and you know, yeah, explores, and that's what I think. Yes. Man loves to do. He loves to explore. And exploring the idea and following the idea yeah. has come into great scientific um, uh, discoveries and so forth where it's advantaged civilization. Mm -hmm. And I say we can do the same with religion. And I don't care if the boat is full of atheists or whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? So th it's good. So we can all see all a inclusive. big cross. Yeah, yeah. all in and see a cross section and, and prove this is either right, right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In an honest way. Yeah. You know, so I think the planet needs a little bit of that at the moment because there's a lot of confusion. You know, there's a lot of people who are, um, you know, who are usurped by this whole idea of power, ego, all that type of thing, and it's clouding the whole sort of viewpoint of this planet, yeah. and then all these wars and so forth, particularly with religious wars and that. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And some of the doctrines that drive them are just completely wrong. And this is why Eden has to come in this day to form as a bit of a correction, mm -hmm. but not going back into the distant past and being held there, but to move forward mm -hmm. for all religions. Yeah. You know? And now, in this time, we do have the capacity to destroy ourselves through nuclear weapons. Definitely. We do have yeah. the ability to destroy our food supply through all these GMOs and 
terminated seeds that wipe out all the uh, the things that came out of Eden, which, by the way, I believe is anti-Eden. It's the whole metaphor is against the mm, the ideals unnatural. of God, yeah. and what Adam and Eve came here to do is de de to develop our food, to create more expansive nuts and fruits and cereals, not to destroy that for a profit. Oh, what the, what's that all about? Mm. I believe, um, you know. What about if catastrophe happens with this this whole monopolization of food? What about if something happens and the seeds don't grow anymore? The terminated seeds deter, uh, uh, terminate themselves and we've got no food anymore. And what's the excuse then? Oh, I'm sorry. You know? Is it, and yet the whole, but then again, there's a prophecy in the Arandi book, if a catastrophe happens, um, there will be an evacuation of the salvable of the planet. Then I say, then who's the salvable? Mm. What marks a person as the sal salvable? Right? The innocent people. The innocent victims of a man-made catastrophe. Mm. And that could happen with our food. You know, because of all these ideas of monopolization. Mm. And I, I think that could be a, one area where we could wipe ourselves too, through our food and all these manipulations under guises, you know. Mm. So, all right, if they develop a, a new brand of, a new type of corn, well, why not develop it where th that corn can reproduce? Now, that would be a better kind of metaphor than terminator seeds. Yeah. What is that all about? So, you know, I, I look at the mentality behind that, and it's purely materialistic yeah. and monopolization over the food market. And what, why, in your opinion, is this happening to us right now? Well, it's man. You know, it's the state, spiritual state of man. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the spiritual state of man not having the truth, the full truth. Um, uh, men walking in the ways of materialism, foregoing God, denying God, denying our past, so he can do what he wants to do. Yeah. You know, see, unfortunately, this planet was set back by two rebellions that happened. Uh, one was the Dalamantian Rebellion, where the sons of God um, rebelled, which was part of a universal type rebellion, which includes Lucifer and Satan. It's not just restricted to this planet. Mm. And that's why the city fell. And the whole idea of Adam and Eve, besides expanding our foods, was to put an end to this rebellion that occurred, but they defaulted as well too, through, yeah, unfortunately, which is recorded in the Bible as well as in the Arandi book. Mm -hmm. And because of those two kind of uh, setbacks that we have, that created a lot of confusion um, throughout this planet throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we can wipe ourselves out now. So th this is why I believe um, the Garden of Eden, the Arandi book, all these things coming together is like an emergency part of an emergency type program yeah. where the truth is in the face of all these people mm -hmm. and then they have to make a, de a decision of where they, where, yeah, it's like the par parting of the ways, isn't it? You know, everyone has to make a decision mm -hmm. at the end of the day and and if they've got something to say, well, then they have to prove that that is right. Mm -hmm. So this is the standpoint of view I come from, mm -hmm. is proving the truth that that is the way and, and hopefully correct uh, religion's philosophy, you know, so we have to avoid these these problems with the truth established, mm -hmm. and that's what God talks about, establishing the truth from the foundations of the earth. Yeah. So the foundations of the earth are like places like Eden and Dalaman, from the beginning yeah. comes the end. end. So yeah, there's a lot of prophecy about that. Was but what is the foundation of the earth? Where is it? You know, so yeah. that's the whole idea, and out of that springs out the book and yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's such important information it's in the book. So, I guess one asks why it is not more known. Why isn't it a top-selling book? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, the Urandi Foundation's whole idea is to make the book available in different translations, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what yeah. they're doing. Their whole idea was to put it, the book in libraries, so people would just naturally you know, find it. Yeah. It wasn't meant to be released under fanfare and all this type of thing. Um, maybe we, ha if we could do more discoveries and get finance to do these discoveries, yeah. it would bring the Iranian book in the forefront. Also, um, really, um, Christianity, you know, a lot of these churches, because it's not the Bible, oh, it's the Iranian book, oh, that's bad. So they already make a judgment before they even look at the evidence or 
a look at the book. So mm. that really shuts down a lot of people. Mm. Uh, see, it's not the people. The people are interested in the truth. It's the leaders. That's the problem. Because they're more worried about what they lose and what, what they gain. Definitely. But but gaining the world, and but if you gain the world, desiring to gain the world, you lose your soul. Mm. Well, you're bringing to light for people, which is really good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, yeah. and a lot of people just goes in one ear and out the other, because everyone's just too busy trying to survive this planet. Yeah. You know, really, Definitely. just trying to survive all this monetary thing and materialism, and yeah. trying to survive, maintain their work and all that, because some guy wants to make all this profit somewhere up the top, or or have have this desire to control everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe in work and all that. But I think, um, you know, it should be a little bit fairer, perhaps, you know. And people should readjust some of their priorities that might make this planet a little bit better to live in. Mm -hmm. And we do have a good civilization in Australia. It's good. And I, I think there's a lot of people who have fared income, but there's a lot of people that need a bit of correction as well, too, through a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Not through a whip or stick or anything like that. Because the only way that man learns it's through discovery, uh, you know, discovery, realization, yeah. and then moving f and and feeling the spirit of interest and wanting to know more and doing his research. That's you know? what life's yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is because it's yeah. all part of the soul building and like having a family. That's all soul building as well and facing challenges, you know, with the truth and um, correcting yourself. That's a major thing. Yeah, you know, if man could correct himself a little bit more. And think about whether this offends my brother or not, mm -hmm. and correct himself. Well, we'd have less laws, mm. you know. We'd have less police, you know. It wouldn't be so overburdened with laws and regulations and so forth. Yeah. Then you think, well, what are these regulations for? To feather the bed of some other entity? Who knows? You know. Well, I guess just steering a little bit off topic here, but it's something that I'm very interested in and wanted to ask you and and that is free will um what is free will do we have it uh does the urantia book speak of free will yeah well we have free will absolutely well god um uh believes in free will because mm -hmm. if he didn't believe in free will we wouldn't have the ability of choice today mm -hmm. and it, look there was a rebellion in this part of the universe if he didn't god didn't believe in free will that this rebellion would have ended a long time ago um, through the thwarting of rebels and so forth yeah. but um, the rebellion was uh, allowed to run its course mm -hmm. and that um, is just an example of uh, free will that is extended from the universe and you know um, free will is really important because God has no, in uh, has no desire to enslave people he wants people, he wants to be a friend of people and and by their own free will, like mm -hmm. in any relationship, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, where there's love, that, that love should be there by free will rather than by fear and enslavement or, or by uh, innuendo. Yeah. So free will is really important uh, by God. It's really important by man as well too. You live better in your free will. You learn moreover more through free will rather than enslaved will mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know the Iranian book advocates that. Mm. So you do speak of a friendship or a relationship that you, you have with God and it seems to be very important so I guess what would be the best way for people to develop a relationship? Oh well yeah that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well God to me is like a friend a friend that's been with me from my childhood and and I've always been open to God and interested mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. finding more about God and I've been through a lot of different various type yeah, churches and organisations yeah. to find out more but I, when I, I read the Arantia book and I was on the um, journey to Eden um, that uh, you know, I felt God really close to me, guiding me, and so forth. Always so, present, yeah. Yeah, always present. And uh, on this writing journey, discovering things, finding things, I feel really close to God mm -hmm. as a friend, not as something out there which is awesome and gets angry, not a God of judgment, but a God of friendship and love and, 
and uh, uh, empathy. And so you're planning on doing more expeditions to uh, uncover this Garden of Eden. Uh, do you have anything coming up? Oh well, um, well, I, I have planned, yeah, uh, plans. I'd like to do a third expedition to the mm -hmm. Garden of Eden. Yeah. I'd like to perform uh, a few drills in a few strategic areas around the Acropolis Hill. I want to get a core sample of the sediments and cross-match the dates with the dates mentioned in this book. Mm -hmm. If that all works out okay, then um, do an ROV deep scan under the mud to see if we can find the ancient roadway, well-built roadways and paths which I assume would be stone pavement and see if we can find um, signs of design in the way of lines and squares and, yeah, yeah. Uh, design that you would find in a city yeah. and if we find that and particularly if that matches some of the design elements mentioned in the Bible regarding the tree of life um, you know that would be a major major discovery and would face uh, change the face of religion mm. or religion on the planet Definitely. So, you know, the whole idea is to, uh, the I read it and I see it in the evidence and um, and then it's up to man to make up his free will decision on things. It is, you know? isn't it? Yeah. But um, that, that would be a good step forward for mankind. Yeah. Alright, well I think that's all we have time to cover today. Is there anything else that you wanted to say, Dennis? Yeah, absolutely. What I'd suggest to yeah, you know, everyone, is to get the Aranti book and read it and do the I read and I see and corroborate the words with scientific evidence and so forth. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. I would do your own research. Yeah, yeah sure, you know, there's a lot of people saying a lot of things and but a lot of people don't make sense and they can't demonstrate themselves. They say these things but where's the evidence? They can't, de you know, not pie in the sky evidence, the hard evidence. And that's what people want these days. They want to read something and they want to see the evidence to give them surety that this is the truth. And this is what this book has done for me. It's set me free. This book has led, led us to the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Adam and Eve. The garden where all our fruits and cereals were grown, which are being destroyed today by ill motive, right? And this is the book I, I would suggest people to read because this is a good book and there's a lot of scientific evidence with this book and it will set you free in my view. So that's my message for today Beautiful. and forevermore, <laughs> everlasting. <laughs> Amen. And to all the viewers out there, we will have Dennis's information um, a link to his Facebook page and to his website at the bottom of this video. Um, and feel free to contact him because he has so much information to share.